Hey guys, welcome back to InventBox, where the solution's right around the corner. In that last video, we were able to get that uh, red triangle to render. It took about 40 lines of code, but um, I think I had in mind that we could, in this tutorial, talk about attributes a little bit so that we can attach uh, like color data to our vertices and then we'll be able to have a triangle with like a red corner, a blue corner, and a green corner. So that should look pretty cool. Um, before we can figure out what to do, probably ought to get a better understanding of vertices and how they work. So I'm going to head, let me switch over to here, okay? So um, the first thing that you would do probably is name the attributes that you want in your vertex shader. We currently have just position. That guy there. But we could also name one called color. Now inside of um, WebGL, there are also generic attributes that are like little slots or storage units, but they don't store um, vertex data like in a buffer. They will store a reference to a named attribute and a reference to a particular buffer. So generic attributes kind of tie together the name that you provide in your shader program and the buffer that contains the data that you want to load into that shader program attribute. Okay. Now the generic attribute will also have some metadata about the data type like is it a float or how many elements um, so it looks something like this you can create a position or sorry create a buffer for every attribute of your vertex make an entry in the vertex shader for it and then when you run vertex attrib pointer you pass in the ID of a generic attribute, that's what it is, or a location of a generic attribute. I think my computer has 16. That might be standard across WebGL and might be implementation dependent, but honestly, you won't need more than five for 95% of what you're doing. Um, and then it will actually connect the currently bound buffer to the generic attribute. Now the binding between the generic attribute and the named attribute in the shader happens automatically. WebGL takes care of that and it will just like do it in the order that you define them in. So position will be zero, color will be one. So you could like hard code in um, zero and one in your vertex attrib pointer calls. But I don't like to hard code anything because what if you switch the order of your attribute definitions, right? And then it would bind to the wrong generic attribute. So instead what we do is after the program is linked, we just go ahead and ask the program, okay, which generic attribute did you bind position to? And it will probably be zero and whatever it is though, we'll enable it and then we'll say vertex attrib pointer to bind it to, or to uh, like link it to the um, currently bound buffer, which in our case we only have one buffer. So that being said, the next step to creating a more interestingly colored triangle is 
to build ourselves another buffer. I'll just do RGB values going from 0 to 1. So red, no green, no blue. Then we'll use green and then blue. So the top corner of the triangle is going to be red. And this is essentially the first ve uh, vertex's color. This would be the, the second vertex's color. And this would be the third. You get the idea. Now we'll create a second buffer, but before we do that, I probably ought to rename this to position buffer, since we'll have two. And this will be color buffer. And we'll use color data. Otherwise, all the options are the same. Array buffers are the type for any vertex attribute. OK. And we got done that step. The buffer's done. We'll put an entry in the shader program. And finally, we will um, connect the named attribute to the generic attribute using the GL vertex attrib pointer command. So I'll probably copy this block as well and just change this stuff in here. But it's not quite that simple because at the moment, both of these are going to try to bind to the same buffer. And color buffer is the most recently bound buffer. So we have to make sure that we rebind the buffer that we want before running the GL vertex add trib. Set the current array buffer to position buffer. Do the same for color buffer. Something that would have made sense, I think, um, would be if you had just passed in the buffer that you wanted to connect uh, as an argument in the vertex attrib pointer. But they probably figured since you're already binding stuff, you're already binding your buffers, they might as well be, let that be the determinant. So, OK, now there's one more thing. We have to run our program. Even though we have, at this point, completed the full cycle, it might work. I'm kind of expecting it to fail, though. Yeah. Um, all right, so there's actually still some more we have to do in our shaders. Well, one thing is. We brought in this attribute, but it's still setting all the pixels to red. So why not just take this attribute and stick it down here? It turns out you can't do that. All the attributes, unfortunately, have to be defined per vertex. And it's not really unfortunate. It's kind of logical because our color data is defined per vertex. I mean, you wouldn't want to specify like one color for every single pixel that it would you just couldn't do that. So instead what we do is we define it per vertex and then we create a different type of um, variable 
I guess. Oh, that's a VEC2. It should be VEC3. Make a VEC3 varying and name it something that's symbolic of what it means. And then you create the same varying in your shader, uh, your fragment shader. And WebGL will kind of connect these two and it will do the interpolation I was talking about in the video two, where if you have a triangle with a red corner up here and a blue corner down here, it will um, calculate all the in-betweens based on the position of the vertices. So it does all that math for us, which is great. All we have to do is remember to set the varying to the attribute. Otherwise, it wouldn't ever store any value. It doesn't automatically know. Okay. All right, so now we're pretty much there, except for little details, and that is we ought to declare a, a precision for our floating point numbers. You can either be low P, high, uh, high P, or medium P. And I like to do medium P because um, not all hardware, especially mobile phones, may not support high precision floating points, um, but most likely you won't be able to tell that it's not high precision because medium precision is still pretty good. And okay, this is the point where I check my console and get to laugh at myself and see what I did. Oh, it would, might be helpful to set our fragment color to V color. There we go. Something that you ought to know is that if you don't use a variable in the shader language, it will optimize it away because it does as much optimizing as it can to make these things run fast. So anything you don't use, it will just completely remove it. So that can be a good thing and a bad thing because it will confuse you, perhaps. All right, so that is nice. Just as a recap, we talked about um, the named attributes, which are just text on a screen pretty much in your shader program. And then there's a list of generic attributes that serve as a, a connection between the named attributes and the buffers that actually hold the data. And when you uh, create that connection, you, you create um, the connection between the buffer and the generic attribute using vertex attrib pointer, and it uses the currently bound buffer. This connection is created automatically by WebGL, so you don't have to do it. And just for funsies, we can actually print out the value of one of these locations. We used it, we uh, used it, but we never saw what it was. So color is stored in generic attribute one, pretty much like we predicted. All right, well, thank you for watching this video. Uh, see you in the next one. If you've got questions, leave in the comments below.